Welcome to Side Alpha Leadership, a podcast where leaders can share their experiences and discuss what leadership means to them. I'm your host, David Polikoff. Hello and welcome to this month's edition of Side Alpha Leadership. As always, I'm your host, David Polikoff, and I'm pleased to have on the line once again a good friend of mine, uh, and I can actually say uh, mentor and coach, uh, Frank Ritchie. Frank, welcome back to the show. You want to tell everybody a little bit about yourself, uh, what you've done, and where you are now. Uh, Dave, thanks for having me on your show. It's a great honor. And uh, currently, you know, I'm a retired firefighter. I think that's the goal of everybody to be able to retire and still be healthy from the city of New Haven. I retired as the drill master and battalion chief, as well as union president. And I currently now work for a think tank. All right. Awesome. Um, and I know you did uh, some good stuff up there in, in, uh, in New Haven, set those guys up for success. So that's uh, kind of like what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about setting uh, the organization uh, up for success. But first I want to talk about uh, actually setting yourself up for success and how you can uh, not necessarily, I don't want to say be a better person, but more of if you're trying to get that job or if you're, uh, you have to do an interview, how can you sell yourself in a positive light without sounding like you have no humility, but to set yourself up to be successful and to move forward in your organization. So go ahead and, and tell uh, the listeners uh, kind of some of the things that you've found out along the way and what you actually can uh, pass on to other people? Well, Dave, I've had some pretty unique experiences. And one of them was uh, after I won my United States Supreme Court case with 20 other individuals, Richie versus the Stefano, I had the opportunity to testify before Congress at the confirmation hearing of Justice Sonia Sotomayor. So during that process, I went through what inside the beltway they call a murder board and a murder board is it's along the same lines as a mock interview where you have individuals essentially playing the role of the senators asking the hard questions and asking the follow-up what we find with a lot of firefighters is that they've spent their whole career building their resumes you know whether it's volunteering for the coat drive or building homes with humanities or taking all those certification classes, uh, receiving an accommodation at work, all of the things that people put into their resume. And then ironically, when it comes time for the one time where you never want to come across like as a jerk, you want to come across as being humble. But the one time where you really have to sell yourself, individuals don't get those things. All of the, all it's like a bank, you know, they've been putting, all of this stuff in the bank, they don't withdraw it during the interview. And, you know, I'll, uh, I'm, I'll let out a little secret. I, I think I played a little bit of role and I want to congratulate you and your success of your new endeavor. And I'll let you tell your listeners about that. But when I interviewed you for the first time, I knew all the great things you did, but you didn't tell them, you didn't give me any of them. You were just answering the questions. And I was like, Dave, you got to talk about yourself. The interview is about you. It's not just about answering the questions. And I think that that's something that a lot of firefighters have trouble doing is talking about themselves. I think, uh, and, and you're 100% right, and I'll touch on, on, on my uh, personal thing here in a minute, but uh, one of the things that uh, we can say about most firefighters um, is that they don't like to talk about themselves. Now, you do have those people out there that like to talk about themselves and pound their chest. But the true budding leaders of an organization uh, do come with a, a decent degree of humility. And, and I'll tell you that when you and I were talking, um, when you first interviewed me with mock questions for the position that I was going for, um, I didn't talk about myself. And, and uh, you know, you brought it to my attention like, hey, man, they're going to ask you this question. It may come in many forms, um, but what they're trying to find out is who are you? Um, I've taken for granted the 35 years that I've worked for my organization that people know who I am. But with my recent interview with a whole totally different organization, they didn't know who I was. And had I not gone in there and told them my history and the things that, uh, that I've done uh, and what makes me uniquely qualified for the position that I was going for, I'd have just been another 
statistic that had gone through an interview and uh, probably would not have gotten the position. Um, so uh, for those that don't know, I will be retiring from my, my organization, Montgomery County Fire and Rescue in Maryland, starting December 1st, and I'm happy to announce that I will be uh, the Assistant Chief of Volunteer Services in Frederick County, Maryland, uh, starting December 6th. So I get a, a total of six days uh, of retirement before I go right back to work. Um, but I'll tell you right now, Frank, outside of what I've done in my career and throughout my life, um, had you not coaxed that out of me, I don't think I would have scored as well as I did. I was told I scored number one on the interview out of the uh, the 12 others. Um, and I, I uh, give a lot of credit to you because you're the one that says this is what they're looking for. On top of knowing the questions that they're going to ask, you have to know the position. So I appreciate your help. So let's talk a little bit about how you're going to have to put some of your humility aside and, and what are some of the things, you know, that, that people are going to have to talk about themselves and, and how can we, uh, for those people that, that do have that degree of humility, how can we break that mold of being able to talk about ourselves? What's the, what's the easiest advice you can give? Well, you talked a little bit about the questions for any interview and the important thing to realize is that it's never about the question. It's always about the answer. And what a lot of times people will prep with their friends or other individuals for an interview and they, you know, they'll go through, Oh, we heard that they asked this question on this interview, whether it's to become a principal, uh, a fire chief, a, a new firefighter. And they basically prepare the candidate to answer questions and they try to give them the answer to the questions. But that's almost always a recipe for disaster because what will happen is you'll get a couple of the familiar questions, but then when you get something that's a little bit off base, something you didn't prepare for, the panel is going to be able to see right through you and realize that these really aren't your answers. The way that I coach and the way that I learned is it's about getting the best possible answer from the individual based off their resume, their work experience, their personality, and how they've conducted themselves over you know the last 10, 15, 20 years of of their life. In your case, your resume was, was unbelievable. I didn't give you the answer to any question. I just made sure that you knew how to answer it. And essentially how I break it down is very simple. For every question asked, you want to make sure that at the end of the question, now everybody's thought process is a little bit different. So there's no particular order to this, but you want to answer the question. That's what most candidates do. That's what you were doing when we first uh, sat down on Zoom. And then you want to find a way in that answer to tell them a little bit about yourself and to explain your thought process. And I like to throw a fourth one in is finish strong, finish your answer with confidence. The panel can see if you're confident, if you have that command presence or not. So again, answer the question, tell them a little bit about yourself and explain your thought process. Those are where the extra points are, and that's where you can start taking a withdrawal from the bank that you've built, which is your resume, for over all these years of working. When, when I went in, and it was funny because you had said, you know, they're going to ask you probably one of the first questions, and like you said, I'd be shocked if they didn't, you know, uh, it's going to be like, tell me something about yourself or tell me about yourself. But they, they could have phrased that question, you know, a, a handful of different ways. But at the end of that question, it was the same answer. They want to know about you, whether it be like, tell me uh, what you've done uh, during your career or tell me why you would be the best candidate for this position or tell me about yourself or, or whatever format is. What you had told me was, they're asking the exact same question all the way through. They want to know, why are you the best person for the job? I've got uh, 11 other guys that are competing for this position. What, what sets you apart? Um, once you kind of cracked that nut for me, then it was like, all right, well, this is the time that I, can, I, I should talk about myself. And I, and I hate talking about myself. But in order for to be able to get the job, you had to be able to tell them who you are. And, and when I coach people for assessment centers, I tell them the same thing. You're going to talk more during the assessment center than you would any other time. They need to know what your thought process is in order for you to score 
uh, points in whatever dimension that they're look that they're grading you on. So if you say nothing, then you don't get any points. So it was one of those. I think that that answer. I had two two canned answers uh, ready to go right away. Um, but the one to to talk about my qualifications and and where I started and where I am today. I want to say that took about eight or nine minutes of me talking, and I only had, uh, I want to say, 35 minutes for the whole interview. So a good chunk of those nine questions, that was eight to nine minutes of just going through my entire history, starting from the age of 12. Actually, I think I started from the age of four when uh, I was going to the firehouse and letting the firehouse dog drag me around, all the way up to when I entered into the volunteer service, entered into the career, and what I've done throughout my ranks. Um, so the information that, that you had given me to be able to pull that out, uh, pay dividends. So when we talk about, um, obviously you're going to have to put that little bit of humility aside in order for them to know who you are. Um, we, we talked about, uh, knowing the position that you're going for. And with that may come a whole different host of questions. So, the one question, you know, you knowing that I was going for the position of assistant chief of volunteer services, you kind of nailed nailed it right away. Of, hey, they're going to probably ask you about recruitment and retention. Um, so, let's tell the audience how you prepared me for that, and then I'll kind of tell them where I went from from that. So, let's talk about some of the questions that you pulled from, um, and I think you were pulling a lot of them right from the air of it, how you coax that information out of me. Okay, so with that question, with any job you're going for, it doesn't have to be the fire service, is you always want to look at the job description because I'm not focusing on the question. I'm focusing on the answer. But if you look at the job description, what you can pull out when you're prepping somebody or when I'm prepping somebody is I could pull out what that position really entails. And look when that job description was last updated because sometimes you could have a job description that hasn't been updated since the 70s. That's not what you want to go for. But if there's a current job description and you want to ask around in the department or the place that you're going, look on their website, see where they're going. For the position that you're going for, we know what are the major issues that are in the news? What are the major issues in the in trade publications? And we all know that comes down for the volunteer service is recruitment and retention that there's a good chance that they're going to ask you about that question. But the The ability to pick out that question came from when I took the time to look at the job description to see what they're looking for in that position. And you had a great background in all you've done. I mean, I remember, and I hope you don't mind if I give away a couple of things, but I remember you didn't even say that you were a lifelong member of a volunteer fire department. That's a position in very high esteem, especially in the Maryland, Virginia area. You just can't achieve that by just showing up once in a while. And you didn't even put that forward. So, again, it's just about getting out what you've already created and what you already put forward in your resume. Now, the thing, too, to remember is while, yes, humility plays a part, but if you're going to bring your organization forward as a leader, you still need to be able to communicate your vision or your boss's vision. And if you don't explain your thought process instead of just telling them what to do, you're going to be a failure. So it's important to, you don't want to dwell on stuff, but you want to basically make sure that the panel and anybody you're trying to communicate your vision to, that they understand that you have some credibility on the topic. And why do you think that way? It's so much easier to get behind somebody as a leader or on a panel to say, this is the person we want for the job. If you understand why they think that way, why is this position important? And when when I went for my interview, I actually had uh, for the very first question they asked is, you know, why do you feel that you're uniquely qualified for this position? And I kind of chuckled in, inside, you know, because I was like, this is exactly what Frank and I were talking about. Um, I had had bulleted points in my uh, my interview packet um, to keep me on track. Cause when, when I start talking about stuff, I, I sometimes like every firefighter, you kind of go off on a different direction. I wanted to make sure I stayed on point. So I had bulleted points, um, that were in front of me that allowed me to go through my, uh, time, my chronological timeline from when I started as a youngster all the way up into where I am today that kept me on track. Um, 
And yes, the other question that they did, and it was like the number one bullet point in the job description was recruitment and retention. And they said, you know, I think the question was phrased something of the nature of, of having, uh, you know, recruitment and retention is a big priority in order to keep uh, volunteers in the ranks. What would you do uh, to make sure that we can not only go out and recruit, but how do you retain? And I had a page and a half, and I even asked him, I said, if you'll indulge me, I've uh, already prepared a written statement for this. And I saw the look in her eyes. Her eyes kind of got a little wide. Um, but I went right down through everything that I had, all my ideas, uh, my thought process, how it would work, what would cost zero dollars, what would cost a little bit in the budget. Um, that answer in itself took about five minutes. So the first two questions right away, you're talking 15 minutes of a 35-minute interview. Um, and, and, you know, they did ask some other questions. Now, one of the things that I want you to uh, to hone in on, you, you would ask me some questions that – would kind of take you out of your comfort zone. Uh, I think one of the ones were, you know, your uh, it's been brought to your attention that some members were drinking in the back parking lot. A call came in, um, and it was reported that those members got on the apparatus. So walk my audience through how uh, you would deal with something like that, because that's not something that happens every day, but it it's a possibility that it could. And Tell everybody how you set me up for that particular answer because I did get that uh, a variation of that question. Well, on any human resources question, the, the thing I always tell everybody is, all right, is there a safety issue involved here or is there something that needs to stop immediately? Something that you can recognize that has to occur spot one. Address that first, say it's going to stop. And then as soon as you stop the act, now you've got to slow everything down. Um, members of the military, members of the fire department, members of the police department, we tend to be a little bit more. Now, I was never in the military. I was never a cop, but I've, I've interviewed enough of them to kind of see the parallels between the organizations. And it seems that everything has to be handled immediately. Like for the fire department, everything's on fire. Uh, I remember one individual one time. Uh, we had a policy in New Haven that if you booked off before a holiday, you wouldn't get holiday pay. It was actually in the union contract. But you could write a letter to the chief of department, and the chief would be able to use their discretion to award you the holiday pay or not, say you had to take your kid to the hospital. And people would send the chief letters, but he would never – they would come to me as a union president and say, you know, the chief never got back to me. And I would always say the same thing. Did you light your letter on fire? And they're like, What? I go, because the chief's concerned about fires. I go, give me the letter. I'll get, I'll get it paid. So we, we, we always want to handle everything like it's, like it's on fire. If there's a disciplinary issue, we want to rush through it. If it's a human resources issue, we want to rush through it. We forget that maybe this is a symptom of something going on and not the actual problem. We don't evaluate EAP. We don't evaluate our were these expectations? Were the rules known to these individuals? Did you put forth expectations throughout your career? Did you project a consistent set of standards and values that your personnel know what to expect from you? And when they're operating at a level that's outside of the rules and regulations, the SOPs and your expectations, is there something else going on at home? But after you stop the immediate act, the thing is you have to slow down and you have to focus on process. I know when we talked about, and that, that's exactly the advice that you had given me, and, and, and you can take a look at any HR issue that we've had in the fire service. When you have uh, a rush to judgment or a rush to get it taken care of, we usually end up either cutting corners, maybe not on purpose, or we miss stuff. And ultimately, you it'll go through the union, it'll run through its course, and it'll end up getting kicked back or overturned because we didn't uh, give uh, – the the investigation what it needed a lot of times and one of the things that you you hit you harped on was due process uh, even though this person may be guilty of doing something they are innocent until proven guilty and we know that in the fire service you know we want to take you know everybody's guilty until they can prove themselves innocent and it's not how it works um, so like you said <clears throat> you got to slow the process down once it's stopped that's the immediate action then you got to actually have to do the investigation and find out what's going on. Everybody gets due process. Uh, everybody gets their say. Um, I think the biggest thing was is, is uh, you end up with you're in the chief's office or your boss's office, and you say, "Hey, 
here's what I know so far. This is how the investigation is going to proceed. I'm confident that I can handle this, but I know that if I need your help, you're there for me, but I don't think it's going to rise above uh, me uh, my investigation, and I'll be able to give you uh, credible information. And I think that was the, one of the biggest takeaways that I took from that particular question is keeping your boss informed, letting them know that you can handle it because you're interviewing for a position and you want to show them that you have the strength and leadership to handle something like that, but also understand that there's a human factor involved here and that you can't just take secondhand information from somebody as gospel. You really have to do your due diligence, do your investigation, and then make sure that everybody has due process. Um, and that's kind of where you had set me up, Frank. And, and there was like two or three questions in the interview that it revolved around an HR-ish type issue um, when it came to uh, um, dealing with this stuff. And, and I think I threw the word due process out there several times just to make sure that they understood that everybody has their day in court. And uh, we're going to make sure that we get all sides of the story before we actually uh, put anything out there. Does that sound about right? Without a doubt, and to sum up um, what you talked about the investigation is you never want to be the lowest rank with the information. That always sets you up for failure. So even if you can handle something at your level, you always want to run it by somebody else. You always want to make sure that your blind spots are covered, but you also never want your boss to be blindsided. So if they get a call from a civilian about a certain incident, you want the boss to already have the information that there's an ongoing investigation, that the department's looking into it. You don't want them to ever be dumbfounded and be like, oh, I didn't know about it because you didn't want to call them at 12 o'clock at night when this, this occurred. So I think it's always important to keep your bosses informed. Along with doing investigations for HR things, in your city or department, who's the director of HR? Who would you reach out to to make sure you didn't miss any blind spots? Are you taking the time before you go half cocked on this? Are you taking the time to review the union contract, um, any policies and procedures, any policies and procedures for the county or the town if you're not dealing with a union issue? Um, you want to take your time and make sure that everything is laid out. And if there is a process for the organization, that you're following the process. Another thing that we see happen all the time, and this goes for the interview in real life, is you'll want you'll the person who does the investigation will want to do the investigation, be the prosecutor, and also be the judge and tell the department head, you know, this is how much the person should be suspended, this is what they should be terminated, whatever it is. That's a recipe for disaster. What I recommend is anybody that's an investigator, when the investigation is complete after interviews, uh, written getting written statements from people, allowing the employee that's accused to know what the charges are against them when charges come forward, letting them say their piece. If it's in a union issue, letting the union rep come in and say their piece with the individual, then go back, evaluate all the documents, evaluate all the interviews, reduce it down into writing. And it should simply be from that investigator that the charges were either substantiated or unsubstantiated. Then that investigation should go to either the department head, whether it's the fire chief or human resources director, and then they can determine what the appropriate discipline is. What it does is it takes the emotion out of it and it ensures proper due process. Yeah, it's funny because I equate everything back when you're starting to talk about these investigations. This is like a law and order episode. The police investigate the crimes, and then they take all that information, and then they give it to the attorney so they can prosecute the crimes. The police don't prosecute the crimes, and they also don't hand out the punishment. Um, that's done by another entity, and, and I think that that's so key. Um, you say, here's all the facts that I have. Here's all the interviews that I have, and here I'm giving it to you now. Um, it's been reviewed by HR. I'm giving it to the boss, and he can look at everything, and then that person will decide uh, what what the punishment is. Does that kind of sum it up a little bit? Yes, but you got to make sure that one of the seven steps legally of due process in America is a impartial investigation. So you have to make sure that you're not just taking the packet that you put together and handing it down. Even if it's a one-page document based off all the other documents, the investigation after the employee has, you get the initial complaint, you file charges, then you 
start your investigation or you may start a preliminary investigation, file charges. Then you do a wider investigation. The employee or volunteer gets to say their say. Then after that interview, you evaluate witnesses. You may call back witnesses. And then at that end document, you have to reduce everything down, even if it's only to a page of this was the methodology of my investigation. This is what I determined from the investigation and the charges were substantiated or unsubstantiated. So now the department had to take this packet and they're saying, okay, we charge them with insubordination and drinking on the job. Those charges were substantiated. Maybe if there's six charges, maybe one of them wasn't substantiated. You have that in there. That way now the chief's got the full packet and now can move it along to the next individual in the chain of command for uh, putting forth what the recommendation of discipline is. And, and that's one of the things that when I, when I talk to uh, aspiring uh, officers or chief officers when they're taking their promotional exam is, you know, the hardest thing that one of the hardest things we do in the fire service is discipline because there's so many moving parts. It's so easy to praise somebody and give them an award or an attaboy or, a, you know, a document of record of, of uh, unit citation or whatever. That's so easy to do. Um, but to do discipline it's difficult, and and uh, you you really have to almost be schooled in that how to perform uh, those investigations, and uh, that's where it will be key for you to contact your HR rep um, to make sure that you are following the correct course of action. Uh, I don't think any of us are, uh, unless we've been in, in that uh, trained in that particular. Um, uh, avenue of of being able to do an investigation, uh, we we end up getting ourselves kind of in a bind because we end up missing steps, and that's why it's so important to make sure that you are talking with your superiors, making sure they understand, but also reaching out to some of the experts out there. We you know in my county we have uh, people that that uh, are HR in the fire department themselves that I I have that resource that I can call, and make sure that I'm going the right direction. Um, I want to. Uh, cut into one more thing that uh, that you had brought up that uh, can also really get the department into a bind if it's not followed correctly. And the one question you had asked me was uh, inappropriate touching of a fee- of somebody of the opposite sex, and they bring that to you. How do you tell my listeners to handle something of that nature if that person comes to you saying that uh, they feel they were inappropriately touched or they were discriminated sexually wise or or, or physically wise? Well, as with any individual making a complaint, the first thing you should do is just listen. You know, let that person that, you know, it's an act of courage to usually bring something of this nature forward, especially in in the fire service. So let that person completely get out everything they have to say. Don't interrupt them. Then at the end, ask follow-up open questions. Document the conversation where fire chiefs, department heads, and individuals across the country get themselves in trouble is when this gets further complicated and the individual says, this occurred, but I don't want you to do anything about it. Uh, Firefighters will do this quite commonly, even with injuries. Ah, I tweaked my back or I hurt my uh, shoulder, but don't do anything about it. You have to set the expectations as a boss that if somebody brings anything to you, that is a HR issue or an injury issue or something that could bring discredit to the reputation of your organization that you have a duty to act, you know, getting a badge or getting a position of esteem doesn't mean that you're the highest paid person in that position. A lot of firefighters get promoted to lieutenant. They think they're the highest paid firefighter. No, you're taking on a position of responsibility. And if you don't want to fulfill that responsibility, you should stay riding backwards. Um, You now are accountable to the organization. So, The first step is to get all of the information. That's the first step. And then, as with any administrative question or any administrative process, then you need to stop, do your homework, and review all of the county HR policies, the sexual harassment policy, 
any rules and regulations, any SOPs. And, you know, there may be immediate action here. This might have been on a training evolution where those two people aren't working together or don't volunteer together. So you can slow everything down. There may be an immediate action. If this person is on this volunteer's duty crew or this person's shift, you may have to call up to the chief and say, I have an initial complaint. I haven't started investigating it yet. However, I've gotten a statement. I've asked the complainant to put the statement in writing. And I think for right now, without taking any other action, we should make transfers on that shift. You want to be cautious not to transfer the alleged victim. Transfers, even in the bluest of states with the best union contracts, are usually a management right and usually are not considered a punishment, especially if they're temporary. So for the organization, because people don't lose money when they're transferred, make sure that it's a money neutral or if they're a volunteer, make sure they're, you're transferring them to a different duty night or shift to keep those people separated so there could be no further harm. That's, that's step one in this process. Then slow everything down, review all the policies and procedures, and then you're going to, if you're the one to do the investigation, then you're going to, what I always like to see done first is ask anybody that's involved to submit a letter about what happened. Or you could go the interrogatory route and send out questions to everybody that was identified as a witness. But however you should do it, it should be done the same way for any investigation. So your investigatory process should be reduced to writing in an SOP of this is the steps that we take when anybody's accused of anything. And that's an easy thing to do. And you want to make it, you know, lawyers want to make it get involved in this. And this is where there should be some pushback from the department head. If a department head, assistant department head is going to do the investigation, you want to make sure they don't write this packet out so that it's so hard to understand that you need a dictionary to understand it or a lawyer to interpret it. It should be just simple steps. You get a complaint, you take all the information. Is any immediate action needed? Yes or no? That would be a transfer, protect somebody from harm, things of that nature. Then do you start off by getting letters from witnesses of what happened? Or do you start off by crafting questions to those individuals? Depending on who you will talk to, people will say, I like to do it this way. Or I like to do it that way. It really doesn't matter. But both of those things should be done. At some point, letters from all the witnesses, and then you want to follow up with interrogatories. Then after you get all that, then you want to interview the witnesses. As you can see, this is a process. It's not going to take 10 minutes like firefighters and department heads want to do. you got to vet everything out so it's fair and impartial. After everybody has their piece, or, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I'll back up. Once you preliminary substantiate that there's a need for charges, then you would bring charge forward, notify the individual of what the charges are, and then let them answer their charges and let the other side see what information you have. I have no problem with that because it's not about getting somebody. It's about ensuring the process is fair for everybody, the accused and the victim. That's what makes America great is due process. Then after all that's done and you conduct your follow-up interviews, then you would reduce it to writing and say whether um, you completed your investigation these charges were substantiated or not substantiated and what you found in your investigation and then pass it up to somebody else. If you're passing it to an independent investigator or corporation counsel's office, you should be able to provide them with, this is how your agency conducts investigations. And before, if you don't have a policy on that, you should work with human resources and corporation counsel to determine what the best way is to to put forth an investigation, but it should be very simple, kind of like an ICS checklist um, where you could just go down and anybody could check the boxes if they're the ones that are, that are tasked with doing that investigation. Because remember, whether it's a lawyer for a volunteer or a union president, if your charges get overturned, that diminishes the com your command, but it also diminishes the ability and the command of the organization and the chief or department head. So you want to make sure that this is being done fairly and a checkbox system works great. And you're going to really have to push against the lawyers to make sure that they don't try to overcomplicate it. So, because the other side, the other side is going to, the other side is always going to challenge the process if they can't defend the act. 
And I think that uh, this should uh, key in uh, my listeners that want to be officers or chief officers, that it's just, it's not all about going down the road and being in command of fires. It's that, that administrative, that ex- obscure stuff that happens. You really need to be on your toes uh, when it comes to any form of discipline and investigation and things like that. And I think, you know, in the fire service, we should at least have some type of training as you reach the captain and battalion chief, assistant chief, and so forth of how to, conduct a proper investigation and what are the good techniques and that's where your HR people come into play that's what those people know how to do to make sure that everybody's getting their due process everybody's uh, you know all the steps are being done correctly uh, in order to be able to produce a report whether it was a substantiated claim or not Um, is that is that a fair assumption Frank uh, yes, I think that's a fair assumption. The worst thing that can happen is an investigation goes forward and gets overturned because you made a process error. It diminishes your own command. So doing things quick for an investigation usually never ends well. You know, like I tell people, don't ever do anything that makes you feel good when you're angry because generally it's going to come back to bite you. <laughs> exactly. Um, yeah, and always make sure your wife uh, reads your tweet before you send it out. So, um, but uh, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I want to switch gears a little bit. So I want to talk about setting our organizations up for success. Uh, once you put on that white shirt or once you you know put on the, the, uh, the bugles and you are a, uh, a line officer or a chief officer, what are some things that you found throughout your career, Frank, that, that sets your organization up to be successful, whether it be your entire organization or maybe you're starting off with your shift and then you're moving out to your battalion and then eventually you're looking at the organization organization itself. So what are some things that you've learned along the way, some successes, some failures, and, and uh, to, to be able to help your organization grow? Well, Dave, I'll, I'll leave you with this. And I think that we all have to realize that the cemetery is filled with indispensable men and indispensable women. The fact is you have to realize that your fire service career or any career isn't going to last forever. So it's always about building up the people that you're with. Um, I want to talk a little bit about base, and this goes for politics and leadership and the fire department and and making your mark, is that there are individuals that help you get to where you have achieved in the department. That doesn't mean that you always got to agree with them. I found that in being in a position of leadership, it's not the loudest voices. Well, that's a trap that people fall into of trying to play to the loudest voices, but it's not the loudest voices that usually cause leaders their most problems, it's usually their friends because their friends are like, Hey, I want you to do this, or I need you to do that. So you have to take that on. And I call your friends, the base, just like in politics, but you don't need to play to your base, but you always need to acknowledge your base and make sure your base is being heard. Same thing when somebody's making a complaint, let them get everything out before you interrupt them. You interrupt them. You just you escalate the situation instead of de-escalating them. Your base, the people that helped you, they want to know that they've been heard in the organization. I'm talking, these are the people in the fire service that generally don't need to be motivated. So when you become an officer, you don't generally need to motivate them. You need to acknowledge them. Your job as an officer is to try to motivate the people that don't have the same motivation of those go-getters, the chargers, the ones that you're holding back instead of pushing in. And any boss, any fire into the commander is going to rather pull their crew back than push them in. Um, It's your job to motivate those individuals without alienating and losing your base, if that makes any sense. It's about mentoring and everybody needs different type of mentoring depending on what they want to do. Some people don't ever want to be a lieutenant. Some people don't want to be, some people want to be the best truck driver. We'll then do things to facilitate them to be the best truck driver, but you got to bring everybody along. I think we have a problem a lot of times in politics where people just talk to people that agree with them. That's not influence. That's not leadership. That's surrounding yourself with people who agree with you. Um, real influence is talking to people who disagree with you and trying to find some common ground. And I think that as a leader, if you want to put forth your vision, you have to find that common ground. You have to motivate the unmotivate, unmotivated, and you really have to be there for the organization and realize that sometimes 
the organization's values and uh, usually your value values are going to be aligned, but sometimes there's going to be things that your organization does that you don't, those that resonate well with you. You got to realize that you're there to represent the organization as a department head or a command uh, command officer. Uh, Justice Scalia said it best when it came to being a judge. He said, if you agree with every decision you make, you're not a very good judge. Well, if you agree with every policy and procedure and decision that you put forward um, to your department, then you're not a very good department head or lieutenant or captain. And one of the things that I see is that a lot of times officers undermine their own authority, and they could do that by simply violating process, not treating people with respect, um, not leading by example, not showing people what's right. You know, I'm not going to wear my uniform properly, but then I'm going to get it on you about this little thing. Um, that's how you diminish your own command. So I think it's important that you realize that it's about the organization and it's not about you. Yeah. When you, you talked about, you know, your friends, those are the ones that are going to end up jamming you up as, as an officer. They're the ones that are going to test you. And I remember when I made lieutenant and I was assigned to a station and, and I had a good friend of mine who was a firefighter. And, uh, you know, we had a, a at the time we had you, you weren't allowed to smoke in the firehouse. You know, you, you were you had to be within, I, I want to say, 15, 20 feet from the firehouse in order to smoke. Um, now we have a no smoking clause, but, uh, at the time, you know, it was a little chilly outside and, and, uh, one of my buddies was smoking in the, uh, in the engine room. And, um, I said, look, man, you know, you, uh, can't be smoking in the engine room. You know, that's, that's the policy, you know, the chief who is actually assigned in our station, if he comes downstairs and sees us, you know, he's not going to go to you. He's going to want to know why I'm allowing this to happen. And, uh, the conversation kind of went like, well, you know, it's kind of chilly outside and I'll be done in a minute. So I looked him directly in the eye and I said, look, don't make me have to do my job. You're my friend, but I will do my job. And he got the message pretty clear. He's like, you're right. I apologize. Put the cigarette out. And, and that was the end of it. Never had an issue after that. But uh, like you said, your friends are the ones that are going to test you first. Um, you know, if you allow things to slide for certain people, but don't for other people, you undermine your credibility, you know, as an officer. And, um, you know, I, I had a captain a long time ago who got on me because I wasn't wearing what he thought were the proper boots. Um we were allowed to wear boots, but this was a specific pair. Um, and he specifically got on me about it for a couple of shifts. And I finally pulled him aside. I said, look, I hear where you're going. I feel that I am wearing the right boots. Um, cause I'm looking around at the rest of the firefighters are on the shift that wearing the exact same boots as I am, but you're singling me out. And, uh, I think it was that eye opening thing for him. And he, he understood that yes, he was singling me out because I was probably the youngest person or whatever. And ultimately I was wearing the correct boots. But uh, it's one of those, uh, you know, one of those moments where uh, the officer actually realized that, yep, I'm not being fair across the board. And, and I think, like you said, it's, it's very uh, easy to lose credibility. It's very difficult to gain that credibility. Um, what are some of the other things that, uh, that you found? I know there was a story that you like to tell, but when you got uh, promoted and you moved into a company and you were coming from the training division and everybody had this preconceived notion about you. So tell that story. Uh, I went to, well, I, I came from the busiest truck in the city. So the preconceived notion came from, uh, you know, my work through fire engineering, being on the advisory board, writing for fire engineering, teaching at the ICU, things of that nature. And so they believed that I was going to have them out training day and night. And I went to one of the most experienced companies in the city. So I had to overcome that. And you got to get people to buy into your vision. I also had a senior captain who was revered by everyone who was a phenomenal firefighter and a great training officer, but had a very distinct way of doing things. So it wasn't my firehouse. It was his firehouse. And even though I was the new lieutenant, I was a guest. So what I did as a way to communicate my vision as a company officer is I worked with my company and then I would volunteer to take over company drills and communicate my vision my expectation, that training. So you got to buy your time. You don't want to just, you don't want to be playing checkers and trying to, to up somebody or that's a recipe for disaster. It's always about playing chess. When you think you see a great move, stop and look for a better one. Um, that's the key to success. So, so I, I balanced it out. And basically what I said is 
you know, from 10 to 12, you're mine. After that, I don't care what you do, you know, 10 to 12, you're mine. We're going to do some kind of training. And what I found was ironically is people like consistency. So throughout, you know, within like six months, they got so used to doing something between 10 and 12. And I wouldn't do dumb drills. I wouldn't do drills for the sake of doing drills. I would do one evolution and I would participate in the evolution, not stand and evaluate. I would participate in the evolution and then we would critique it. So instead of it being this long drawn out thing, you know, most of my drills were less than an hour long. And then we would talk about it and I got buy-in so that I was vice president of the union at the time. I'd get a phone call after the union business. I wouldn't take the company out for those, those that hour. And I'd have a guy with 35 years on the job come in and say, Hey, are we going to go do something today? Cause they knew it was never about punishment. And I got them all the buy-in to training because it wasn't punitive and I did it with them. So I made the mistake when they were making the mistake. So I would always start off after of, Hey, this is what I would do different now that we did it like this. And it would get everybody to open up and it increased our efficiency on fires. And I had one of the best shifts in the city to begin with. And this just, hone their skills because all of our drills and all of our training, almost everything we do is perishable. If you don't do it. So you got to get out and do it. You got to be, you got to be hands-on. And for someone like yourself, Dave, um, who really loves to get involved, you know, if you're a chief officer and you're working with your hands, you're not working with your mind. You're not doing your job. You could get somebody hurt. However, in training is an area where you could still fill that command role, but, every now and then on certain evolutions, you can jump in and do the evolutions with your crew because it's going to gain you credibility, gain, gain you respect. And it also kind of gets out that, that, that bug of, uh, I got to put my hands on this. So it helps you be a better boss. Yeah. That was one of the things that you and I talked about when we, we going back to the very first part of this podcast, when we talked about, you know, doing the interview, the, the one question that you'd said, I'd be surprised if they didn't ask you is, you know, tell me a weakness or something like that. And, and, uh, you know, one of the things you said is don't go out there and, and, and really, you know, torpedo yourself about all your weaknesses or everything. Find a weakness that's not necessarily a weakness, but maybe you perceive it as a weakness and then how you have overcome that. So don't just leave it on the table as a weakness. And mine was, like you just said, I like to work with my hands. You know, it, when I became when I went from captain to battalion chief, you know, I still carry a hook when I'm assigned as a forward position. I still carry a tool in my hand, and and I find myself, you know, when we're changing crews over, you know, I'll pick up the hose line, squirt some water, or pull some ceilings. That kind of gets it out of out of my uh, my system. But as a chief officer, you have to worry about the strategies as opposed to the tactics. So, if like you said, if you're working with your hands, you're no longer working with your head, and you're not seeing the big picture. But how I overcame that was through training. Uh, when my guys are doing some training, whether it be pump evolutions or whatever, I'm putting my gear on. I put my evolu- my SCBA on, and I'll grab a hand line and, and flow some water, or I'll watch them do some pumps, or maybe even run the pumps. So that gets that itch, at, that, that scratch that itch out of my system. But like you had said, it also lets the people see that, hey, you're human, and not only am I going to do this evolution, I'm going to do be the first one to do the evolution. So if I make a mistake... People see that, hey, this guy's human, he makes mistakes, and he can recover from them, or it's okay to make mistakes, and we'll learn from that and move forward. Um, that's one of the things that I learned from you a long time ago, is don't be afraid to make mistakes in front of your people. It allows them to see that you're human, and it's okay to make mistakes. Absolutely. The key to making a mistake is you make a mistake, you recognize it, and then you share it. I mean, that's the that's the whole thing. You share it, and you say, hey, don't... You, I, I always like to say, you know, anybody can learn from their own mistakes. It's only the wise learn, learn from other people. So that's kind of uh, that's kind of the goal. Unfortunately, Dave, I'm at the witching hour, and uh, it's amazing when you retire, you're going to find that uh, that you're like, how did I ever have time to work? Because there's always something banging at the door. But it's always a pleasure to talk to you and your listeners. And uh, I have a recommendation for you for a guest. Uh, to come on your great show. And that is Victor angry. He is, uh, he's the, he's the County executive for Prince William County, Virginia, second largest County in Virginia. He's a volunteer, but he spent 22 years in the military. And he, um, I, I always get confused with military ranks, but he, uh, ended up 
getting to the point uh, where he was in charge of the entire National Guard. The guy's got a remarkable story, and he's a remarkable uh, individual, and I think you'd really get a lot from talking to him. And he wrote a book, uh, Angry Leadership, which is uh, I'm reading right now, and it's dog-eared and underlined. So um, somebody I can recommend for you to reach out to. Well, I would get that information from offline. And Frank, as always, your time is valuable. I get that, and I appreciate you uh, carving out a little time for me. Uh, real quick before you go, do you want to plug your FDIC uh, conference? This is another avenue you can get it out there. Um. Well, I'll plug two things. If somebody needs help with a promotional interview, whether it's entry or chief officer or lieutenant, or whether it's even to become a principal teacher or cop or any position, uh, feel free to reach out to me. Dave uh, knows how to get in touch with me. Uh, I also want to thank Anthony Castro, who uh, gave me a small little part in his uh, book, Mastering the Assessment Center, where I talked about some of my strategies. And at FDIC this year, I'm going to be teaching about, it's still about the victim. Uh, I think it's called aggressive search. And uh, I look forward to seeing everybody at FDIC uh, next year. And Dave, as always, congratulations on your new position. You're going to be tremendous at it. And uh, you're a true leader. And uh, Frederick County, Maryland is very fortunate to have you. And I wish you all the luck in your new endeavor. Well, thank you for everything, Frank. And I'll catch up with you at a later date. Have a good one. All right, bye. If you like this show or any other show, please leave us a five-star review on whatever podcast listening platform you're listening to. You can look for us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. If you'd like to contact us, please don't hesitate to drop us a note at sidealphaleadership at gmail.com. Thanks for listening.